Hey guys, another Friday live stream. I'm gonna take out in the shop, show you what's going on. Let's double check in with our live, make sure everything's good. Come on, go ahead and invite a few people. There we go. Awesome. We're good to go. Finally, we finally figured it out, guys. So sorry about the multiple weeks of skewed, goofed, whatever. Not looking pretty. So we're back. We got to figure it figured out. Let's go check what's going on out in the shop. Let's go start over here. We got Eddie arm deep in something special. Let's check this out. Whoa! Three ninety two Wrangler. Something special's going on here. Some real specials going on here. Doing a uh, crate motor similar to our Demon one seventy, Satin one seventy. Real easy to get to the gas tank now. <laughs> so this is uh, this is the way we're gonna do this one. Just get everything super accessible for us. Make our lives easier. Helps with quality of work. It's just it's the way to do a build like this. So check out those nice OEM Fox shocks. Uh, this one's gonna be crazy. This one's gonna be crazy. Over here, we have our thousand wheel horsepower TRX. Ready for the mod list? Turbo, injector, booster pump. That's it. Stock motor, stock trans, and of course our catch cans, sitting pretty. How's it going, Eddie? How's yeah. you doing? Getting it? Yeah, just doing some finishing touches, putting some heat wrap and protecting, making sure that this new turbo kit doesn't burn any of the OEM lines or hoses or anything like that, just so when it gets up to operating temperature, everything is safe and, you know, right. safe and quality. Absolutely. Going over everything, making sure. Of course. Yeah. Got to keep it 100%. So all that all that shiny stuff is just that anti-heat uh, anti wrap. Everything cool. Right. Finishing up here. Got those Willwood four-piston conversion, or sorry, six-piston on these 20s. And again, that was a thousand wheel with a big old tire on it. So that's, you know, ain't nothing to sneeze at here got the other turbo trx in the air still turbos getting right it's gonna be a unit going to be a unit i can't wait for this thing especially with the white i love these white trx's they're so pretty jeep back in the air everything's going back together finally got that one that we were waiting on headers situated so this one's uh, just up here for some safety, safety checks. Of course, detailing as always, in-house ceramic coat wrap, chrome deletes. You got a whole bunch of chrome on your car, you wanna get rid of it, we can do that too. Let us know. Let's go see what's over there. We got this gorgeous Pro Charge Ram on the dyno again for some diagnostics. is it's an e-torque interesting interesting setup so, let's go check out what else we got over here Woo! fascinating little blower swap on this one nothing too crazy nothing too crazy there she is ready to go that pretty got some transmissions palleted up ready to ship out so moving and grooving as always y'all nice look at this beautiful turbo setup mm. all right let's head in these questions answered just double check see where we're at invite some more people some questions answered Jay, you ready? Yep, be right there. Go ahead and get her set up. Awesome. How are we looking? We're looking good. 
Looking very good. All right, let me go get my notepad. I'll be right back, y'all. All right, everybody. While he does that, <clears throat> we'll jump in. So hopefully you like the uh, the Turbo TRX there. It's another one that we're excited to, to get back to the customer. He's real patient. We actually, I don't know if Tula went over, but we use that for our test vehicle for potentially trying to turn into a mail order kit. A lot of people ask about it. I'm sure people are intrigued about it. Um, the reality is the downpipe section that goes to the cat back is very hard to jig up and duplicate um, for quality fitment. So it's one of those where we made the decision to keep the single turbo kits in house. Um, but that being said, we also do the helium kit. That's what's going on the shop truck. Um, it's also a great option um, that you showed them the one out there that mm -hmm. you know is being worked on. So, yeah, sure. um, so yeah, you know, I mean, you got a couple options available for you there. So. All right, now we can dive into the, uh, <clears throat> the Q&A questions, uh, uh, could you, should you, and uh, see what we got going. So, mm -hmm. uh, One from last week on a streetcar application, if you're going turbos, should you, could you air to air or air to water? Uh, so generally, on a, that, that you can go either way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as an example, supercharged applications come with air to waters, right, because they're, they're mainly built into the blower uh, in a PD setup. Um, you know, Vortec on their centrifugal setup even utilizes a air to water. Um, it, it, it's one of those, it, it can really go either way. Uh, air to water has the potential to be more efficient. Um, if it's plumbed correctly, it has a, a large enough um, uh, system in regards to fluid transition, uh, the right flow. Um, the reason why a lot of people don't like to go with that is it adds a lot more. So yeah, mm -hmm. you need a pump, you need the heat exchanger, all of the lines, more fluid. So in a turbo or centrifugal blower application, you're normally going to see an air to air, it's just simpler. Um, the benefit to the air to water, when you talk about a daily driver, is a chiller system, right? AC chiller. So we, we utilize um, IC chiller on most of ours, FI inner chiller as well. Um, you can use your AC system to cool the fluids mm -hmm. in an air to water. So when you talk about a daily setup, there is no better way to bring those temps down. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people, uh, you know, centrifugal more so, or even PD blowers, um, you know, the chillers are great because as you drive, the blowers get hotter and hotter. Mm -hmm. Turbos not so much because it's based off exhaust gases, so they recover a lot quicker. Um, but it's still going to be more efficient if you can turn that uh, inner chiller setup on and, and drop those air, air to water temps um, significantly down to freezing temps, you know, even below freezing. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to transition and pull out more heat. Um, so most of the time for a street car that wants a little extra power on a turbo setup, we're going to run an air to air um, because it's always there, um, you know, and, and it, it will drop what you need. Um, street track cars, air to water with a chiller, nothing kind of beats that. You know, you can do an ice tank, but still even that, the, the AC chiller for a street car, roll race car, great for that because the more you drive, the cooler it gets. Um, that's where the benefits of an air to water come into play. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that, that can go either way. So, uh, could you run either? Absolutely. Should you, that will be truly based on, um, the application for it. But most of the time in air to air is more than enough for most people. Now you mentioned the, uh, the inner chiller. Uh, what's a good time to upgrade the factory red eye chiller system? What, what's that kind of good for? Is there really a limit or is it kind of, you know, basis by basis? Yeah, case that, case? yeah. You know, so from the factory, you're going to see that they're going to limit the, um, the temperatures of the intercooler to around mid 50s. Mm -hmm. um, they do that for condensation reasons. You know, anybody can speak to when they have, uh, you know, real, real cold temps down in the teens or 20s. Sometimes on the, the restarts, the hot starts, there's going to be some condensation buildup, so you have to compensate for that in the tune. Um, that's why from the factory, they actually limit what it is. So their goal is not to drop it as far as they can go down. Mm -hmm. Their goal is to just get it so it's more consistent. Mm -hmm. um, so when, and that's up to you, you can do it on a stock vehicle and drop those temperatures down more, just understand that what you might face is going to be that condensation um, in the startup. Um, so that, that's where the aftermarket systems come into play. They essentially override that, allowing it to be even more efficient um, and cool it even more. So on my red eyes, you know what I mean? I, I kept them where they were because they, they served the purpose of what I needed. Mm -hmm. um, but that it doesn't hurt to necessarily upgrade it. And then now that they have the plug and play system, so you can still use the dash on the, the 19 and, or the 20s and newers, um, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That That's nice to where it's less intrusive, but it just increases the efficiency of it, um, but it's not necessarily mm -hmm. required. So hard to say, there's not really a point where it's like, oh, but this modification list you need to go. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else. Uh, for a street car, mm -hmm. uh, twins or a bigger single? 
that does not matter. Um, so when it comes down to turbo kit design and what turbos can produce, um, the truth is that a large single turbo setup <clears throat> is technically going to be more uh, power and thermal efficient. So uh, the goal is to try and get as large of a single turbo kit as you can to produce the power that you need. The problem we start to run into on the higher boosted applications or the higher horsepower applications is you run out of room for a single. Mm -hmm. um, if you ever tried to fit a single into a Hellcat engine bay, mm -hmm. you'll notice it's very difficult. Um, Trackhawks too, you know, we got some wild ones out there, but there's a ton of modification that goes into it. Um, that's why people then, you can jump to twins because you can get two smaller twins to equal the airflow that you need from, um, you know, compared to that of a single. Mm -hmm. um, spool wise, people have this misconception that a twin kit will spool faster. The only reason for that is people will generally put smaller turbos on. If you think about it, a well-designed single turbo kit has eight cylinders in our application mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, mm -hmm. Hellcat 39257. Eight cylinders are going to help to spin that turbo, that one turbo, versus twins have four. So it all comes down to, you know, properly specking the turbo kit. Um, the other piece about it too, having smaller turbos, you can fit them closer to the exhaust manifold. So <clears throat> a lot of ways people do uh, single turbo kits like on older WK1 platforms is pretzel pipes as we call them where they route both manifolds into a pipe that goes up to the front versus our single manifold setup. So you have a lot more exhaust piping on a single which can make it laggier. Mm -hmm. So concept of it is um, and the design, the pipe and everything do affect it. But in reality, a single turbo that flows the same as two twins will outperform twins beer purely on efficiency and thermal efficiency. Mm -hmm. So good question though. So. We like to try and fit a large single up to the point where we can't anymore, and then we jump to a, a, uh, a twin setup in there on mm -hmm. after. So. Uh, scat pack, should you, could you, shorty headers. Great one. Mm -hmm. um, scat absolutely. pack, Hellcat. Yeah, scat, scat pack, Hellcat, we're going to say, uh, could you, yeah, should you, no. Uh, and, and the reason for that is if you've ever actually seen a 392 or a Hellcat manifold, they're basically shorty mid-length headers. Um, they're actually pretty large, they flow very well. Um, so there's not really a benefit by pulling off the stock manifold and throwing on a shorty. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, oh, I gained power. The reality is, is if you did one with a high flow cat at the same time, that's where any type of potential performance came from is changing that mid fight. Mm -hmm. But you will see no gain by putting a shorty header um, onto a 392 or a Hellcat. There's absolutely no reason mm -hmm. to do so. No. What about like a 5.7, like a log style? 5.7, uh, maybe a little bit. Again, it will depend on the mid-pipe you run. Mm -hmm. If you do just the manifold, but leave the big old cat on and, you know, not go to a high flow, mm -hmm. um, you might see a little bit of a gain, but to, to take full potential, it needs that mid-pipe as well. Um, but again, if you're going to go through all the labor and everything like that, it, you might as well take that jump to the, the long tube. But that is a very good very good question. Um, even the TRXs benefit a little bit because the TRXs have a very loggy style manifold compared to the other Hellcat applications. So we have seen small gains from those. They benefit greatly from long tube headers compared to the other applications because normally in a Hellcat or somebody's stock bolt-on or a small performance package, mm -hmm. I won't recommend to do long tubes, but a TRX will will benefit greatly from that. Mm -hmm. So, um, But that's a very good question. So could you? Sure, should you on the 392 normal Hellcat? I, I don't see a need or a benefit unless you have a crack in one and you don't want to buy OEM, you can go with something, but there, there's not really a gain or benefit from it. So, mm -hmm. uh, so going, sort of going back to that uh, intercooler question, yeah. on a turbo setup for roll racing, what would your choice be? Uh, it depends on what type of you know, times you're trying to produce, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, you know, it's, it all comes down to the horsepower goal. Mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily going to be, like I said, if you spec a single correctly and it's going to achieve the power you want versus... You know, specking a twin, it, it's a horsepower goal. One is, like I said, not necessarily going to shine over the other if it's built and spec correctly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that, like I said, we try to get a big single in to achieve that power, and then if you want more power than that, that's when you dip to a twin. So mm -hmm. that will just depend on the horsepower. Gotcha. Um, our catch cans, mm -hmm. street versus the race. When, you know, do I need a race catch can on, you know, a stock 5.7? Great question. How so, many do I need? What's... Yeah, so we'll go to the purpose of a catch can, right? So all, all of Vehicles from the factory come with crankcase ventilation, the PCV system. Um, and essentially what that's doing is taking the crankcase um, air and pressure um, from the factory and they route it back into the intake system to prevent it being released to the atmosphere for the good old emissions, EPA, everything like that. So um, what catch cans do is give a spot for those oil vapors to gather before it makes it back into the intake system. Why? Oil vapors reduce octane. 
Um, it also gunks up and, and you, you get a lot of uh, nasty stuff inside the engine, spark plugs, O2 sensors long term. Um, it can't even destroy cats long term. So if you give it a place to gather all of that, you're doing it. Mm -hmm. That's what a catch can's for. I know people say, oh, it's not beneficial. That's what you're trying to do is prevent oil from going back in. Um, race, what ends up happening is when you get to these race car applications um, for off-road use only, you don't want to necessarily put it back into the intake and with the flow being so high because of the high boost, high, or high power applications that you might be putting this on, instead of routing it back into the intake system, you just want to vent it um, to give as least amount of restriction as possible to make sure there's no crankcase pressures. Um, pressure behind the pistons is not good at all. You want to get rid of that and that's the whole point of this. Um, that's why on, on another reason from the factory, they utilize a little bit of vacuum to help mm -hmm. suck those out and give it a place to go. So that's why when you see on the higher ones, you'll hear about vented uh, cans. It's just to reduce as much restriction as possible because you have so much pressure coming from whatever given application you have, built forged pistons that have a little tolerance, 30 pounds of boost, mm -hmm. combination of all of it. You want to let those, those pressures go to prevent any type of rear main seals, uh, crank seals, valve cover seals. Um, anything like that blowing out and you know if you ever wondered hey I have a boosted application I'm going through rear main seals or my crank seal I keep having to change you probably have some high crank pressure and you need to you know address that mm -hmm. um, and that, that's the other thing to consider as well if you're NA going boosted mm -hmm. keep in mind they have a port that goes from your intake manifold to go back into your crankcase because normally there's no boost to do so mm -hmm. under wide open throttle it just creates more vacuum to suck it out all of a sudden, you're introducing boost. The last thing you want to do mm -hmm. is blow boost into your, your crankcase. So make sure your PCV valve works or, um, you know, vent accordingly and, and process, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that it's set up pre-throttle body, whatever the case may be, if you do it that way. But good question. Mm -hmm. And then um, speaking of the race catch cans, mm -hmm. you know, like a built, you know, high horsepower application, let's say 1,200 plus. Yeah. You know, could you get away with one, or is it recommended to have two? When when did we kind of start? You know, yeah, that's that's one of those. More is not a bad thing when it comes to crankcase ventilation. Mm -hmm. So our personal shop car that was, you know made the fifteen hundred mm -hmm. twin turbo four twenty six. We had two cans, one to each side of the engine, the uh, dash tens all the way, mm -hmm. and I had no crankcase issues. Same thing with the uh, the turbo TRX out there that right. I was showing you on the live stream. If you catch. Yeah. Uh, that top support bar, we got two race catch cans mounted up there Correct. for that so, same reason. More is, is never a bad thing. Now, you know, we understand they cost money running hoses and stuff like that, petting space. Um, we do have a couple 11, 1200 horsepower applications in which we ran a hose from each valve cover to one catch can. <clears throat> Every application is a little bit different depending on how the motor was assembled, the tolerances by the, the engine builder, how many miles are running, mm -hmm. the amount of boost you're running. Um, so you will have to gauge it off of the amount of crankcase pressure that you might be seeing. So you can start with one. If you see a lot of signs of crankcase pressure, you can always jump to two. Um, but yeah, that, that's going to be hit or miss depending on the actual application mm -hmm. given. So you say 1200 horsepower, how is that right. actually happening and how right. is the motor built? Um, so that will be the, the determining factor. What would, what would be those signs that you talked about? Like what, when would I say, oh boy, I really need a second? Yeah, so uh, like you said, like we mentioned originally, is any type of seals blowing out, mm. right? So if your crank seal, rear main seal, valve covers, any rubber seals of the engine that might see excessive pressure. <clears throat> the other one is you see your catch can filling up pretty quick. Um, what that means is those pressures are all trying to escape from that one port that you have or where it's coming from. Um, it, it doesn't have enough release out of it. So um, Cooley B. Coolin had started off with one catch can on his track hawk, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we ended up having to jump to two because his catch can was filling quickly. As soon as it went to two, the problem went away. So you kind of got to gauge it. So mm -hmm. there, there's no way to truly measure it other than you try it out. Um, so that, that's kind of that's a great question mm -hmm. of how and when you just kind of figure it out. So. Could you run one? Sure. Should you? You gauge it off of what happens there. So, uh, I, mean, I don't know if it's a loaded question, but I, let's just say 15 or newer for simplicity's sake. Mm -hmm. Could you, should you, when, should you, if even needed, run a standalone on a Gen 3 Hemi car? How good are those PCMs as far as what you can do? You know what I mean? Yeah. Great question. Now, uh, <clears throat> and that depends on what type of vehicle you're referencing, right? So, you know, we'll start with the Hellcats, like mm -hmm. our shop car was. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, our shop car made 1500 wheel, um, you know, ran eights consistently, and it was on stock computer, stock TCM, everything mm -hmm. like that. So, um, eight speed, the whole shebang. Um, the 392 applications, you know, they don't have wide bands from the factory. They don't have um, the ability to correct fueling at watt. So, that's where kind of the benefits come in. 
Um, there are some perks with, you know, anti-lag, uh, building boost, uh, trans brake two steps. Um, the actual way you can tune it is, is obviously more complex being it's a standalone. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's going to be, honestly, streetcar wise, I, I, I have yet to see a reason or a need for a Holly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have several 1400 wheel horsepower plus cars mm -hmm. uh, boosted by blowers, nitrous, combination, turbos, all of it, and they're all on factory ECUs. So, <clears throat> you know, that, that's one of those things where, um, yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, there's not really a thing. If you're going race car, that, that's when you can, you know, have it, you know, take that jump. Uh, that's the other thing is right now, not many, I don't, there's really not many, you know, standalone PCMs that actually operate the transmission. So you need mm. to get a separate trans controller at the same time, depending gotcha. on the transmission. So it starts turning into something very complex that right. the factory said it does well. There's very good standalones for both the PCM and TCM, but now you're just compounding up on the cost of new computers right. when the factory does pretty well. So go in race car and that's all it's for and you want every little bit of efficiency and tunability, go for it. Street car, I have yet to see a reason for it. Mm -hmm. so. um, Bolt on car, okay. just basic, basic stuff. Cold air intake, do they really give horsepower? Is it better sticking with a stock air box and a drop in? So the, the fastest, is, so if we're talking, um, you know, NA, 39257 yeah, cars. Yeah. yeah, so on those, all of our, um, all the data we have, the, the stats we have, the timesheets we have, the dynos we have, factory air box is more than enough mm -hmm. um, for a basic bolt on setup, even a cam. Uh, the factory air box is not a restriction. Um, what it does though, compared to you know an open you know cold air intake is it, uh, it it battles the heat soak right the material it's made out of the fact it's boxed in the way they have it shielded it, what we notice is on the big end sure you know when you're mowing at 80 90 or 100 miles an hour a cold air intake is getting that nice fresh air um, which the factory air box doesn't struggle with mm -hmm. um, the big differentiator we see is when you're sitting up staging getting ready to launch those open box you know mm -hmm. open air filter element type Intakes are just sucking in hot air, so you see a sacrifice in low power of that mm -hmm. 60 foot because it, it's sucking in 160, mm -hmm. 180 degree air. I mean, yeah, that that uh, that 14 Jeep we did the cam on with the cold air. Yeah. His intake air temps got to what was it, 180, 190 yeah, idling in the parking sitting. lot. Yeah, so you imagine going up and you, you're ready to launch, right. and it, the first gulp of air it gets is 190. Um, I will say the factor air box would come become a, a restriction about. 530 wheel horsepower give or take is where we start to see a little bit of vacuum created mm. by it and that's where you're going to sacrifice a little bit of that uh, heat soak to get the amount of airflow that you need but usually when you're at a stage like that you're going to have a high stall converter big monster cam so you don't need low rpm anyway so you're going to shoot past that and um, you know the, the effect won't be nearly as difficult but yeah the fastest 392s we have with bolt-ons and cams all in factory air boxes and I've had multiple cars at the track at the same time same mods except for the difference being the the intake system and generally the stack air box ones stand out in front quite a bit so um, um good question I think one last question here how to get trans brake two-step line lock if you even can on an older Hellcat 15 to 17 pre-demon pre-red eye so all of those so two-step you know, we have the um uh, M, uh, MSD one um, that we plumb into the wiring so you can do a two-step that's always on the shop car mm -hmm. um, in regards to a trans brake when it's the eight speeds they're working on it right now um, they're finally starting to crack the canvas on it because it's all canvas based um, if you learn know how the demons do it there's nothing mechanically different than the Hellcat transmissions of the HP 90s it's all uh, canvas controlled so they're they're starting to crack that um, so you, you can do that, um, like anti-lag, rolling anti-lag, there, there, you know, there's some tuning tricks you can do with it, but um, again, that's where, uh, you know, race car versus street car, right? Mm -hmm. That's where it kind of starts to kick in there. So you got to really kind of, you're going to sacrifice some things, right? Because um, also they're starting to get into it, which is nice with the, the Holly finally releasing the ability to plug in and still take over the canvas and the amenities of it. Um, but yeah, there's tricks and, and things like that, but that's one of the perks as mentioned earlier for what the standalone is. But you start to really lose some of the amenities until recent times, some of the amenities of a streetcar. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, one I had, yeah. this will be the last one. Any more questions that come through, we'll use for next week. Mm -hmm. um, we just had a, a request for our level two on a red eye. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Um, what a, a level two is, for example, on our Hellcat applications, is an upper lower pulley combination for E85. <clears throat> um, we offer it because people still want it. Um, we offer it because people have 
you know, work done prior and it allows us to put those modifications on. But um, the 2 7 blower from the factory, especially during COVID times, had a lot of issues being overspun over stock. So our 317 level one, we've had no issues on it. I personally, on my red eyes, ran a, uh, a 286 upper uh, with no issues. But beyond that, we, we've actually had blower seats. So mm -hmm. generally, yeah. we don't. We, we, like I said, we the reason we have the level two is an option. If somebody comes to us and says, "Oh, I have HD race bearings um, already in it, and I just want your pulley combination," that's how we can offer it. But generally, a two seven, we highly recommend if going anything more aggressive than a level one to get the blower ported um, with the upgraded HD race bearings. Um, and we have yet to see a failure on one, as long as its the RPM is controlled correctly. But um, I have seen several two seven blowers fail with a uh, upper lower combination. Uh, unported, and it's mm -hmm. not the porting, it's more so the, the HD race bearings and the support from those, but if you're sending it off, might as well get it ported Absolutely. anyway. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, that that's one of those, we don't generally like to do the level twos by themselves just to the high risk. We educate our customers, and the early ones, like the 18 and 19s, um, you know, Demons and then the 19s for the Red Eyes, we don't see a lot of issues with that. It kind of stemmed from when COVID came around, 20s and newer. Um, that we, we've had some, we've seen over the years, um, you know, them locking up just by being overspun. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not crazy, it's not, we don't do, you know, a, a 286 upper 10 lower, it's not aggressive in any way, shape, or form. Um, but it's enough that we'll throw it out and it could destroy your blower. And if you're lucky, your motor will live, but we've actually seen some that eat metal afterwards. So mm -hmm. um, to answer that, and, and anybody with the red eye or a 2.7 blower on how fast you should spin it, mm -hmm. just stick with a, a basic, you know, 310 upper. Um, and, and kind of leave it there unless you go ahead and get the HD race bearings. So. One of our uh, real old YouTube vlogs, we actually covered that and, and we showed the metal on top of the yeah, intercooler yeah. bricks yeah, from that. Cooley's car, he, he had it. We did our level two on it back in the day before this was really discovered. It was very early on in the red eyes and his, he was just cruising on the highway and it, you know, only a couple hundred miles on the combination and it literally locked his blower up. So um, you can see the carnage if you reference back to those. But, mm -hmm. um, Awesome. Thank you for checking in again, everybody. Uh, we're going to head out. It's lunchtime. Yeah. Um, so any more questions or anything you want addressed on the next vlog next week, please leave the comments below. Um, and thank you again for checking in. We'll see you next week.